So if you have a Bible, uh, let me invite you to turn to Psalm 3. Psalms are pretty much right in the middle of the Bible. If you want to use uh, one of the blue Bibles that are in the chair racks to take a look at it, you can find it on page 569, the third Psalm. We're doing a short summer series looking at these first handful of of Psalms in the Bible. And the beauty of the Psalms, um, kind of like I was just praying, is their ability to relate to every season of life, to take almost any and every human emotion and put them into to words. We need that as human beings. And poetry does that. Even the, even the hardcore science um, and math people recognize that. I, I saw a quote this past week. Uh, Dennis Gabor, who was a Nobel, Nobel Prize winning physicist in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, he said, poetry is plucking at the heartstrings and making music with them. Poetry plucks at the heartstrings and makes music of them. That's what the Psalms do, and that's why they're in the Bible, and that's why it's good to, to study them. Now, interesting here, just as we start to read, um, you'll see that Psalm 3 has a heading. It has a, a superscript. That's the first Psalm uh, to have one of those, a little descriptive title that tells you something about the author, maybe, or the setting of the of the psalm, and in case you were wondering, that is part of the original Hebrew uh, source documents, so we should understand that as part of the biblical text and not just something that, you know, one of the modern translators has kind of put in. There are headings in a lot of our Bibles that the modern translators put in, and they're helpful, uh, but they're not scriptural. These little headings, though, these superscripts above the psalms, and most of your Bibles will have them in different print, so you can tell the difference, but these are part of the original Hebrew text. So let's read Psalm 3, and I'll invite you to stand if you're able to do that, and when I'm finished, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord, and invite you to respond by saying thanks be to God. Psalm 3, a psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me, many are saying of my soul, there is now no salvation for him in God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people, Selah. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Um, it always seems to hit in the middle of the night, doesn't it? It just works that way. You're fine in the morning, uh, you're fine in the afternoon, but you wake up in the middle of the night, and that's when the, that's when the fears hit. Uh, and that's not, middle of the night, that's not the time then to figure out what you believe. It's too late by that point, uh, because you're not thinking clearly at that point. Everything in the middle of the night seems big. You don't figure out your theology at 2 a.m. if you can help it. I got to visit uh, this week the newest baby in our uh, congregation, and it reminded me of uh, something that the nurses at Christiana Hospital told Stacy and me about the late night shift in the maternity wing in the middle of the night. This is what they said. They said, it always seems to boil over at 2 a.m. That's when it happens. Mom, dad too, but especially mom, hasn't slept maybe a day or two at this point. Uh, all the relatives have gone home. The baby shower is a distant memory at this point. And all the new parents are thinking about is how completely inadequate they are for the job of parenting. And life seems at that moment very, very overwhelming. And the nurses say they just come out of their rooms like zombies, these moms pushing their babies in the bassinets and tears running down their faces. And that's not the time, the nurses know, to start spouting statistics and do giving deep parenting wisdom or anything like that. They just need to come alongside them. Right, lift up their head and ultimately, if they can, get them back to bed. But how? How do you sleep when the world around you seems to be closing in, when fears are big and God, at that moment at least, comparatively speaking, seems very small? Life can be like that. People, situations can be hard. Fears can be real. And figuring out how to deal with your fear is not something that you can do when you get to 2 a.m. in the middle of the night. You need to do it now in the daylight. And Psalm 3, I think, can help us with that. Now, it's not very hard to divide the psalm into sections. Every single commentator I read does it exactly the same way. They give it different titles, but it's the same basic division in the, in the psalm. Some will divide it into four pieces. Most of your translations will have little space breaks between each of the two-verse 
kind of couplets in the, in the psalm, but I'm going to divide it into three because I think you can group the middle two uh, sections together. Uh, and in my bulletin, I kind of give you some headings to sort of uh, hang things, little pegs to hang things as we go through. But in verses one and two, uh, we see the enemies that we fear. Uh, verses three to six, that middle section, David talks about the source of his peace. And then in verses seven to eight, we see at last the hope for victory. So three, three sections, the enemies we fear, the source of of peace and the hope for victory. Now, first, let's acknowledge the fear. Let's start there. Now, this, this is the one point that I don't have to actually prove. <laughs> uh, I just need to acknowledge. I don't need to prove it because we all know that there's things to fear in this world. We know that sort of instinctually. We live around it all the time. But we do need to acknowledge it because, uh, because otherwise, if we just, you just skip to the encouragement, you just skip to the victory, it sounds as if you're just being shallow, that you're just ignoring the reality of how difficult things can, can be. You know, all smiles, but no recognition that there's actual pain. And Psalm 3 does not undersell the extent of the problem here that David's facing. Look at verse 1. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Lots of enemies. Verse 6 later says many thousands. Thousands of enemies. All right, so what's going on? What's, what's What's this talking about? Now, this is where the psalm heading, the superscript, this is where it becomes really helpful. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Now, there's about five chapters in 2 Samuel, from chapter 13 to 17, that is packed in to that short little heading. (laughs) And the reader of the psalm would have known probably what David was was talking about, but we might not, so so later maybe go back and read for 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 13 to to 17. It's pretty depressing, really. Uh, But suffice it to say, David isn't exaggerating here. He has a lot of enemies. He has a lot of things legitimately that he could be fearing. Now, just a quick recap of what he's referring to. First, you did read it correctly. David is on the run from his son, Absalom, who's chasing him. Absalom was one of David's uh, sons who is leading a coup, a rebellion against his father. Remember, David's the king of, of all of Israel. And Absalom has decided that he'd be a better king. Feels like uh, he's been wronged, that he's uh, been offended, he's been mistreated, and he's leading a rebellion that has turned into, at this point, a virtual civil war. Now, it's a complicated story, like I said. We, lo- we looked at it a, f- a few years ago. I preached through 2 Samuel, but it really is that bad. A- Absalom had been quietly undermining his father's authority in Jerusalem for years. And then, when I guess he felt the time was, was right, he finally goes to the city of Hebron and he declares himself king gathers around him an army, a group of people who he had been preparing to kind of be sympathetic to him, and they're getting ready to march on the capital, take control of of the nation. So David gathers those who are loyal to him in the city, and he flees out of Jerusalem. He goes down out of the city, across the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, and toward the the desert to, to hide. That's the context of Psalm 3. When David's talking about all these enemies, that's what, that's, that's what's in the immediate view. And you might say, I'm not sure that's relevant to me. I'm not an ancient king whose son is leading an army against me. But there is a sense in which Christians are always in a battle, aren't we? Similarly speaking. There's lots of enemies of Jesus, lots of places in the world where Christians today can say things like, how many are my foes? Many are rising up against me. Or it can be counted in the thousands. Even here in our Western culture, relatively tamed by comparison, but it's not just at the Olympics, it's not just in popular media, sometimes it's very obvious from those around us that there are many who oppose what we believe. But you don't even have to think in terms of thousands for this to be relevant. You don't need to even need to think of thousands of enemies. All you need is one, right? If he or she is determined enough, one enemy is all you need. Could be on the job, co-worker, a boss, could be at school kids right Right? ever had a bully ever had somebody make fun of you could be in your own family maybe it is a child like it was for David maybe a parent maybe even a spouse you don't need a thousand enemies you just need one that's enough to fear it's enough to get you up at 2 a.m. now importantly I don't think that we can think of our enemies we need to be careful of this just as those people out there Uh, one of the greatest uh, battle reports in all of history a report on how the battle went. Commodore Oliver Perry, the U.S. Navy, War of 1812, uh, after his victory against the British, the Battle of Lake Erie, he reported to General William Henry Harrison, 
So if you know your history, kids, he later became president, but he was a general, William Henry Harrison. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Commodore Perry reported, we have met the enemy and they are, they are ours. We've met the enemy and they are ours. That was, that was the one line. That was all he needed. We won. Well, in 1970, this is how this is relevant, a poster, an advertisement, a, a, a poster against polluting the environment took that famous quip and kind of flicked it and said, we have met the enemy and he is us. Now, I don't want to debate the modern environmental movement, but the Christian could probably say nothing that is more true about himself or herself than that. I have met the enemy and he is me. Jesus tells us that. Mark chapter 7, he's arguing with the religious leaders. They're trying to tell him that all the enemies that make people unclean, about someone makes them unholy, that they all come from the outside. Things you eat, people associate, you associate with. And Jesus says, there's nothing out, this is from Mark 7, there's nothing from outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And then he lists a bunch of evil enemies, sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and deceit. And he says, all these evil things, he says, they come from within and they defile a person. And that would have been true for David. I mean, certainly, look, Absalom was responsible for his rebellion. That was his sin. That wasn't David's sin, you know, rebelling against the, the rightful king. That was Absalom's responsibility. But David was far from an innocent party in the in the matter. I don't have to, time to get into all of it, but Absalom first got really mad. The first time Absalom got really mad at his dad, it, was, it had been years before when another son of David, by another mother, whose name was Amnon, the son, the other son, raped Absalom's sister, Tamar. And David did nothing, or almost nothing uh, about it. Failed to, conf failed to conf confront the sexual sin in his, in his son. And his other son, whose full sister was the one who was assaulted, obviously got rightfully really upset about it. And many people believe that it was David's weakness in confronting the sin of his son and because of the, that it was because of the lingering guilt of David's own sexual sin in his own past, his adultery with Bathsheba, his murder of Bathsheba's husband, that kind of led to his failure to confront Absalom when, or when, uh, to confront Amnon when Amnon uh, assaulted his, his half-sister. All I'm saying is here, David isn't innocent. Which is why the taunt of verse 2 probably would have hit home a little bit when it came. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. In other words, that's what the enemies were taunting. There's, you're beyond saving. You're too far gone. Now that taunt of being too far gone, that's not true, as we'll see. But the reality of David's sin, the reality of his guilt, that certainly is true. David had thousands of people who wanted to kill him. But his greatest enemy, just like my greatest enemy, just like your greatest enemy, is actually yourself and the sin within your own heart. Right? Biggest enemy is not some anti-Christian radical in the popular culture or a bully in the office or on the playground. Your biggest enemy is you. That's actually something to fear, Jesus said. He said it, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus said, quote, don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Now, he's not talking about don't be cautious around those who want to kill you. But he's saying, look, at the end of the day, don't fear them. Don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, what's to fear? Well, given the state of your own heart, you should fear the justice of God. That's your bigger problem. So maybe I just made the problem worse, haven't I? I have. Because you thought I was going down the road of saying, don't worry about all those other enemies because God's on your side. He'll protect you. Isn't that right? Isn't that where you thought we were, we were going? Well, we'll get there, but we have to start by making the problem worse before it gets better. And the reality of our rebellion against God means that we have turned in our rebellion the God who would be our protector. We've turned him into an enemy. We're Absalom trying to take the throne from the rightful king. Chasing, the, ch chasing him down, trying to make the case that the world would be better, God, if I were only in charge of it. And that makes, rightfully so, the one who is truly king really upset. Fear that, Jesus said. All right, can we be saved then? Can we be rescued? Is peace even possible? Well, David does find it, peace I mean. Moving more quickly now, but it's verses 3 to 6. That's where it happens. David goes through. He remembers the way that God has taken care of him, how he's always taken care of him in the past, and the comfort that, that, that God has given to him. 
Right? The lies of God abandoning David, they don't stick because he knows God too well. He's known it experientially. God has never abandoned him. His past experience leads him to confidence that God's going to show up again. Look at the language that David uses in verse 3. The Lord is a shield about me, he says. Not just a little shield on the, on the arm that can kind of block a blow. That's actually what, if you translate this word, that's actually what it was. But, it, but, he's, but, but the way the, the, the construction, the way that it's, it's phrased there, it's a shield, but it's a shield that, that turns into a shield about him. It's a full covering, something you can hide behind. The Lord, he also says, is his glory. Now, that's a loaded word. We use glory all the time. But what does that mean when he says that God is my glory? It means that he's found a way somehow to make God the source of his comfort and the source of his security. Have you ever thought about this? The source, the, the, the essence of sin is to have competing glories. To have competing glories. What does that mean? It means that whatever you run to, to find safety, to, to find rescue in the midst of your fear at 2 a.m., that's your glory. You want to test? There you go. Right? Ask this. What's your fear? What are you afraid of? Find your fear, and you'll probably find your false glory. Right? Do you fear people rejecting you or making fun of you? Well, approval of others is probably your glory. Is having enough in the bank, is that an obsession? Are you always anxious about finances? Possible that money may be your glory. They aren't bad things. They could be good things. They could be necessary things to think about could be real problems to deal with but when we take them and we are unable to be sh unable to shake the fear in the midst of being concerned about those things then the good things have become my glory i, I saw a story uh, the other day um, about two women competing at the olympics uh, this 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 olympics that's happening now in the judo event two different countries um, competitors uh, Odette Giafrida from Italy and Larissa Pimenta from Brazil. Uh, the two, two different countries, uh, two competitors in the, in, the, uh, in the Olympics, but they have a special bond because I learned Odette, the, the one from Italy, actually speaks Portuguese and she had previously traveled to Brazil where she met Larissa, some competition presumably, and Larissa introduced Odette to Jesus and Odette became a Christian and they've been close ever since. So close that before the Olympics began a couple of weeks ago, they had a conversation about how they were going to, how they wanted to compete in Paris in a way that gave all the honor and the glory to God. They said, that's what, that's what the conversation was about. Let's hold one another accountable to this. Whatever happens, whatever we do, we want to give all the glory to God. Now, Olympic competition, that's a big accomplishment. But these two sisters in Christ decided in advance that the Olympics were not going to be their glory. Okay, so the Lord's our shield. He's our glory. He's the lifter of my head, David says. And that takes it even a step farther. He doesn't just protect us, God, like a shield. He's not just our source of identity, my glory. He actually restores us. Think about it. When you're sad, when you're afraid, when you're ashamed, your head is bowed down. You can't look the world in the eyes let alone look God in the eyes. And God gently wraps his hands around your face and picks it up and says, lift up your head. Lift your gaze. Restores you. Now, that's all great. All right, but I have to say, at least for me, uh, that doesn't answer, none of those things answers a very big question. And that's the how. How's that possible? How is an enemy of God made into a friend? How is a a wretch made a treasure. How is a slave a son? How, how does that happen? I mean, it's great that David seems to think, seems to be confident that it's going to happen, that it will happen, but where does the confidence come from? What's the source of my hope? That's the last point, the hope of victory. David turns to the Lord. He realizes that he has no chance of rescue, no chance of restoration in himself. That's where it starts. My salvation belongs to the Lord. That's what he says. And there's two references in the psalm to, to David going to the Lord, to, to praying. One of them, of course, is verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Wow, okay. Um, so David's not pulling any punches here. 
in, in what he's asking for based on what he knows about God. He says, Lord, I can trust you to save me because you're the one who strike my enemies on the cheek. Now, that might sound tame, you know, a little cheek slap, right? But it's not. To strike on the cheek, what he's talking about here is to shame the enemy. That's all you had to do. I mean, through a lot of, you know, human history and culture or whatever, all you had to do was just slap someone on the cheek and, cheek and like, I mean, that was a challenge. You were dueling next to the death. It was, it was, a, it was a mark of shame. And God puts, David says, he will put my enemies to shame. And then he says, right, there's this bit about the teeth breaking. Certainly not too tame here. Going to need some dental work. That's what David's saying. But, the, but it's not that much different, actually, than what you think. To take the teeth out of an enemy. Think about this right? What does that mean? It means to render that enemy powerless, to defang it, to eliminate its ability to threaten you. It might still be there, but the snake is not as scary if it's just like gumming you. It might be gross, but there's no venom. There's no injection. There's, no, there's nothing that's going to, to kill you. It's just, it's defanged. Okay, great. That's wonderful. But still, how? How does that happen? How is it possible? How is it possible to get from here to there? David seems really confident of it, but but how do we do that? Well, if you go back to 2 Samuel, from chapter 13 to chapter 17, like I told you, the whole terrible account, family destruction, national civil war, right? Absalom declares himself to be king. David decides to leave Jerusalem. He gathers up some of his faithful followers, and they leave the city. And in the process of leaving, David is confronted with some, some some news that some other prominent leaders have left too, people that he thought were going to be on his side. They're defecting to Absalom. It's just getting worse and worse. And then in 2 Samuel 15, 30 to 31, this is what it says. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. Shines of mourning, right? Head down. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up, weeping as they went. And it was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Another blow. And David said, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Redeem this, he says. Now, I don't know if this is the same occasion for the prayers that David's talking about in Psalm 3, but it certainly has the same theme, and it would have been around the same time. David is on the Mount of Olives, and he prays to the Lord defang my enemy, God. Make whatever they're going to do absolutely useless. Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Let him just be gumming away. David is looking for salvation on the mountain. Psalm 3, 4, right? I cried to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. Now the Mount of Olives where David goes as he leaves Jerusalem, where he prays in 2 Samuel 15, that will play a significant part in understanding the how. The how of God rescuing his people. How does it happen? The Mount of Olives is about 2,700 feet high, rises about 200 feet above the city of Jerusalem itself, and David goes up the hill weeping because he's in exile, head down, no longer welcome in his city. And he travels with a relatively small number of faithful followers. And David goes and he does the only thing that he knows to do. He prays. Now follow me here. Because thousands of years later, when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem on the Sunday before his death, he was welcomed into the city as a king, into his city, Jerusalem, where he was the rightful ruler. But just four days later, after he had celebrated the last Passover with his disciples, that we will commemorate here at the Lord's table. Just four days later, the political winds in Jerusalem had completely shifted. And Jesus is leaving the city of Jerusalem after he had eaten this meal with his disciples because he was about to be rejected. And where does he go? He climbs the Mount of Olives. He takes with him a small group of friends. Now, he had sat on that mountain earlier in his ministry, Jesus had. He had taught his disciples there. He had told them that the Absaloms of the world, they're going to come. They're going to continue to come. He was telling us the enemies are going to continue to come. Mark 13, he he says, there are going to come lots of rebellious pretenders to the throne. People who think they're the Messiah. Don't be fooled. But now, Jesus is not teaching his disciples. He's climbing the Mount of Olives with a weight of sorrow that far exceeded any, any sorrow that David must have felt. And instead of crying tears, like David cried, 
it says in Luke 23 that he was sweating drops of blood. And instead of asking God for victory, Jesus is asking the Father whether or not the cup of his judgment that he was about to drink might be taken from him. He was praying a, praying a prayer of rescue. Now the blood that came from the pores of Jesus on the Mount of Olives, it was not in any way a sign of Jesus' stress or sorrow over his own sin, but in a way that David could never have fully comprehended, in a way that now is only clearly visible to us, Jesus nonetheless was willingly putting himself under the discipline of God, the discipline, the justice that you and I deserve. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus was praying a prayer of rescue. Lord, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. But he followed it up with praying, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus entrusted himself to the righteous judgment of the Lord, and we should be forever grateful that he did. Because from that willingness to accept the judgment of God on our behalf, to absorb the consequences of the enemy, to take the blow on the cheek and the punch to the mouth, because Jesus was willing to do that from his sacrifice, comes down to us from that mountain, our rescue, the answer from the holy hill. And when you recognize that in the middle of the day, but especially at 2 a.m., that's what lifts your head. Uh, last week at the Olympics, uh, Brazilian Larissa Pimenta, Italian Odette Giafrida, they met. Bronze medal match. Only one could be on the podium. And it ended up being Larissa, the woman from Brazil. And overcome with emotion, this Brazilian woman fell to the mat in absolute tears. She didn't know how to process it. She just defeated her best friend. And then walking over to her came her Italian sister in Christ, who just lost, no medal for Odette. But Odette knelt beside this woman who had just defeated her, hugged her, and began to talk to her. The cameras caught them talking, but no one knew what they were saying. Larissa was asked about it later in a press conference, and they asked Larissa, what did Odette say to you? And she said, well, she reminded me of the conversation that we had had just a couple days before. She told me to get up, to lift up my head, because all glory and honor should be given to him. And Odette helped Larissa take her face out of her hands and lifted her off the ground. But you, O Lord, are my glory and the lifter of my head. Because Christ took the cup of God's wrath, and because he fell, we rise, and he gets all the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the goodness that you've shown to us, even in the midst of our rebellion. Oh, Lord, we pray that as we come to your table today, you would impress that upon us, that you would work in our hearts the need and the desire for your mercy and then to revel in what has been provided through Christ. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.